Buenas tardes. Um, I'll be real honest with you, it's hard to follow that, man. And um, I'm not in Arizona anymore either, because they don't let you talk like that down there. Is anybody in here from Arizona? All right, you know what I'm talking about. So I, I'm here to discuss some of the work done at the previous school, Apollo, uh, Ju uh, Apollo Middle School. I'm getting those two kind of mixed up. But um, does any wa anybody watch the videos on PD360 on Apollo, some of you? P please don't let me hear you saying, boy, he's gained weight. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before I go any further, I need to thank two people, actually three. Um, Lorena Martinez, one of my assistant principals, and Tammy Christofferson, the other assistant principal. If it wasn't for them, none of that stuff would have happened. Um, you need help and you need experts to help you. And both of those are geniuses and they're on their own schools now and they're both winning awards and one of these days you'll you hear about them too. But um, we made an agreement, if anybody ever gets asked to speak about these, you have to mention the other two, so keep them in mind. <laughs> um, and my wife. She's the one that kind of pushed me into this thing. She, she told me, she, she worked at a feeder that fed into this Apollo and told me, go and take that school. You know, go and do something. Um, you also have to know this, that I, in my past life, was very, very a radical Chicano, a little different from a, a Hispanic, uh, pretty radical. I used to wear the Che Guevara shirt, the whole thing. <laughs> <coughs> and so what we did there at Apollo, I think, was probably the most radical act that I had been engaged in, uh, a, a true uh, break from a lot of different things that had been happening to our kids, some of them intentionally and some of them just happened because of the way the structure is. So as I'm rolling through this, it's not as, um, it's more of a, of a stream of consciousness presentation, but you'll hear things from uh, Dr. Covington from uh, uh, Detroit, you heard him say something, you'll see some of this, in, in some of his things in here. What Greg just spoke about, you'll see some of those things here. So I think I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, opportunities and challenges for us as educators, of course, the first one, big opportunity, the new iteration of a reform model that's coming to us if it's not already with us. In Arizona, we're just now beginning to roll in. We don't know, I, I don't know. You know, it looks pretty good. I know there's a bunch of things in there that sound pretty good. And I'm hoping that the uh, uh, implementation of Common Core is better than the NCLB because NCLB sounded pretty good too. Our, uh, one of the other challenges are Latino demographics. I'm not gonna throw numbers, I think you're probably aware of them. If you're not, run to Google and look at the Latino demographics in our nation. Um, but the real challenge is um, the moral and technical obligations we have in front of us. And I split our work, my work, into two pieces. The moral things that we must do and the legal technical things, yeah, we have to do those too. But one really weighs heavier than the other one, and, and hopefully you know which one. Um, because of those things, every school in our nation now is a turnaround school. If it's not turning around, that means we're probably following an outdated model. If you're in the process already, congratulations. If you haven't really thought about having a turnaround school on your hands, um, time to do that. Let me see, where are we? Okay. Um, this achievement gap, we were talking about that earlier, Dr. Covington called it a systems gap. There's lots of different things, but at the end, Latinos are not achieving in a very pernicious way. It just does not go away. It doesn't go away after three generations. The, the work I did, uh, did some doctoral studies, I'm, I'm ABD, I didn't finish the dissertation, but um, the first generation kids, you know, the new immigrants is one thing. Second and third immigrants, these are monolingual English speaking American homegrown, the whole deal, are not reaching. For what reason? And they might be attorney's kids. They might be doctor's children. They're not reaching the same uh, uh, achievement as other kids. And there's, there, what's going on there? Um, there's two factors here that trump any of the ideologies. How you feel about immigration or not immigration or the rest of the stuff is those demographics because they're not going to change. That's also pernicious. It's not going to change. And the economics. Because if we don't change them, another country will own us. Those countries are looking at us, kind of licking their lips, because they understand that we are not moving that our youngest group, this large, untapped potential of, of children, 
We're just not moving them yet. And it's not like we haven't been warned. In 1991, ASCD put out this uh, paper, education, Educating Everybody's Children. We know what we need to do. And here's what they talked about. You can read that. Breaking the cycle. It talked about Haberman's article on overcoming a pedagogy of poverty. Our, our, our schools, uh, let me talk about my school. I don't know your schools. My school, uh, Apollo Junior High, very good at what it was designed to do. It is designed to create labor force that were compliant, that were going to take orders, and weren't going to do a lot of thinking because they didn't need to. Somebody else was going to do that for you and tell you what to do. They were pretty good at doing that. Um, if you read that pedagogy of poverty, on the other end of it, there's a pedagogy of plenty, where some folks get critical thinking skills and so on. And in many schools, that still occurs. We need to do the possible while waiting for perfection. That was in that paper in 1991. Ten years later, Morrison Institute down at Arizona State uh, came out with this paper called Five Shoes Ready to Drop on Arizona's Future. First one, they needed to attract brain power. There's that Latino uh, education dilemma. This is, this is 2001. And you look at those numbers, 50% graduation or 50% dropout rate. And that represents 50% of the population under 18 in, in Arizona. Fuzzy economic identity, this is before the giant crash, real estate and tourism. If you don't have any money, you can't come tour Arizona. But Arizona was being built. And I mean, if you ever go into uh, Phoenix, I just moved into Phoenix a year ago. There's gigantic pieces of Phoenix who are, which are still kind of just uh, frames of homes where the, the economy just stopped, and so did the home building. And then this fractured leadership at, at pretty much all levels, but at the state level, down through the counties, and even into our school systems. And then uh, the tax base was too lenient or too reliant on uh, sales taxes. So here's the suggestions. This sounds a lot like what we were talking about. Curriculum rigor, getting better teachers, keeping the teachers that are good, um, increasing technology and school safety. Okay, now that's 10 years gap between ASCD and then uh, the Morrison Institute. Then they did it again in 2012. It's a little shorter. The future they predicted 10 years earlier, it's arrived. And now it's not just a warning, there's alarm bells going off. It's scary that we have not been able to move the needle. But it's still there. And again, it's not about ethnicity, or I'm sorry, it's not about ethnicity, it's, it's about those demographics and the economics. Okay, well there is one place I think that we kind of went ahead of the curve on this thing. Um, I throw this in kind of like an inside joke, my superintendent will walk by, our assistant superintendent will walk by and ask me, uh, and I'd walk up, hey, my name is Ray Chavez, I'm at 265 Western. We say, what do you keep saying that for? Because you never come by, you never visit. <laughs> So I thought maybe you didn't know. But that was a good thing because I, I kind of got to do things and got away with doing things when nobody was looking. So that's okay. <laughs> I call this part of the presentation from hope to faith. If, if I'm ripping anybody off and if you're in a room, I apologize, just jump up and shout. Um, but it's not so much about theories, although I'm kind of, I, I know a lot of the different theories, and I could, I could do that, and I can, I can give you some of that if you wanted to. Um, but it's not so much that, because the work is grounded in those theories. Theoretical, but it's the practice. But it's my viewpoint of what can happen when you get that theory and you turn it into practice. And it's more about creating a school that's imbued with respect, rigor, and relevance. You've heard that before somewhere, right? But in this case, the relevance rolls right back into the home culture, that the school reflects and uses the first learners um, um, and the first teachers of those kids. Okay, a little bit more. Very complex. Challenged by, and it's just ingrained concept of what's academic success. Um, an A at Apollo before I got there was not an A at some of the other junior highs I've been at. Teachers know what they know. This is a frustration. They know what they know. The frustration is what you wish they knew. And if you're a principal, you don't understand what I'm saying. Now, what Greg was saying a minute ago, let's talk about these things. And teachers and other folks sometimes don't want to. Upper administrators, uh, the upper echelons, 
sometimes want things that are system. And I wanted things that were student, and I mean individual students sometimes. How do you get an entire system to talk about mediating uh, students crossing into the multiple worlds they live in? And that's uh, Philon Davidson and Wu. And of course, time. How do you have time to do all these things? Um, my little school, 98% Mexican descent, and I use descent because, like I said, these, most of these kids were third generation here. Um, the building was 45 years old, a little older school. Very stable population. Some of the grandparents went to the school. The community very, very blue collar oriented. The problem is blue collar work doesn't exist around that school anymore. And the community is committed to the school. You will go to Apollo. From there, you'll go to Sunnyside High School, and then it'll be over, which was a big deal in that district. Um, having it be over, that was not a good thing. We had to work on that a lot. Um, Apollo 1.0 had an adult focus, low expectations for the students in the present and for the future. There was a pedagogy of poverty. We talked about that a minute ago. Parents, uh, trust in the teachers was being abused. And according to Arizona Learns, when I took over there, school was underperforming year two. There isn't a year three in Arizona. Uh, at that point, the state takes over the school. I was hired. They told me, we're going to hire you. We're going to take a risk. If you don't, can't move the school, we'll find somebody else. That's the school. Uh, you can see the different kaleidoscope of colors, blue on the roof, yellow, green, and pink on the doors. The kids call the place Skittle Middle. <laughs> That's the library when I walked into it, full illumination. That's what kids in that school were supposed to be learning from. You can see the water stains on the roof, missing tiles, and the chairs all mismatched. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the rooms, live wires sticking out of the wall. And so this is the way the kids responded. But this is even worse. This is eighth grade work that was given to an eighth grader. And when I walked in there, I asked the kid, what are you doing? And she looked at me like, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm coloring your. Then she, you want it? And I took it. And you can see she put her little signature right there on the your tummy. <clears throat> and I kept that your. OK, in a, in a single year, we moved that school from Performing, underperforming year two, past underperforming year one, past underperforming to performing. Uh, we had people come and investigate us to see if we had cheated. <clears throat> we reduced the disciplinary referrals from 3,600 or so down to 425. With a school of 1,200 kids, that's something. Kid, middle school kids get into things. I don't know if you knew that, but they really do. <laughs> <laughs> Our attendance went from 94 to 98%. The following year, we were up at 99 the parents and the students now were becoming, to be, uh, becoming, were becoming satisfied with the school. Here's some student voice. Uh, I'm going to skip through, through the rest of them. I'll let you read this one. The school has changed a lot. All of us, student council and the students of Apollo, are proud to go every day because it's a lot better and, it's, and is looking so nice. I'm going to skip that one and go to this one. <clears throat> I would like to thank you for helping us out with Apollo to make it as great as it can be. I have noticed a lot of changes. This school has improved so much. Our teachers are more trained. Our school looks cleaner. Our students are more focused. And Apollo is now turning into a place that I can learn as much as I want to. So how'd that happen? Now use those quotations. You'll see throughout the little rest of the presentation, you have little quotations. How, how did that happen? These are people's, what happened? <clears throat> First of all, the whole thing was built on respect respecting students. If you give them Eeyore, they're going to burn your bathroom. If you pitch high and fast, like the kids like that fastball, after a while they get used to it and they like hitting home runs. Uh, you have to mediate that kid's uh, home world, though. The world they live in and the world at school sort of kind of have to match. And if they don't, you have to try to explain how they can get to the one that's uh, going to give them the payoff academically. <clears throat> Again, the ac academic rigor encourage students to exercise their agency. This right here, I did it in faculty meetings, and I had a rebellion the first time I told the teachers. If, and I told students in a, you know, the general meetings that we'd have with students, and then in small class intimate meetings. If a teacher's giving you stuff you already know, it's too easy for you, tell the teacher, I already know this stuff, I need some different. And if the teacher refuses to change, you have my permission to get up and walk out. 
but you walk to my office, and I'll walk back there, and we'll fix the problem. The second or third time the kids began, really? Do you, can I really do that? The second or third time kids did that, uh, the teachers, like I said, wanted to find out, well, well don't give them or or anything like that. Pitch hard and fast, and the kids will start digging it, and they did. <clears throat> but because of that, we began to build students' possible futures. What, what is possible for you? Rather than hanging around the neighborhood and you know, doing things uh, there in the neighborhood, we also sent the right message by things that we did, like canceling. We had a graduation uh, ceremony at the school. The kids would line up and get their worthless little eighth grade diploma, and it was like, that's telling the kids, you're done. That's telling the kids, giving them the wrong message. So I got rid of that and created a, a dinner for parents to celebrate. You need to involve parents. And I did that by going to ask parents to come to the school and talk to us about what is right, what is wrong. Uh, we asked the business community to get behind us. The business community had this little, uh, what do they call it, like like, kind of like a chamber of commerce kind of a group. They came and told us, after three months of coming to us and us working with the kids, shoplifting dropped at their businesses. So now they became very, very curious about how to help us. Social service agencies, we made room inside our school so they could come and they didn't have to go to the kids' homes. They could, the kids could come right to them, right inside the school. <clears throat> and these other things, school board, city council, so on. Really what we're looking for is equal, seeking equal status and services across zip codes. We had a thing called Pasfui. And it sounds kind of like, that, uh, other administrators told, would tell me, it sounds like Chinese food, right? <laughs> Pasfui is preparing all students for university enrollment. The kids had it on their, on their shirts, they had it on their uh, on our, uh, stationery, they had it everywhere you saw it. It's all over the school. But really, it was about creating life options that were not decided by the school, but were decided by the student. And really, at the end, group community work become community-minded. We needed to challenge the structure of learning and teaching, what kids learn, how they, how they learn it, how the teachers teach it, what they're teaching. If you look at some of the videos, the teachers are talking about what, how they taught things and what they taught the subject that they used. Um, and then engage all the elements that support the student transformation, funds of knowledge from uh, one of the professors at University of Arizona. Those are the legal mandates. I don't have to tell you what those are. But we were, um, well, those are the things we have to do. If we don't do those things, then you know, people come and get you in trouble. We're constant about our purpose at Apollo. What do we do? What do we don't do? do we model for the kids. If we don't want kids to yell in the hallway, guess what? You, know, you, don't, you don't yell either. Get down from there, stop running. You don't need to do those things. We learn and behave as experts. And there's a certain composure you need to have. And also a very certain type of optimism. And finally, this last piece, foster hope, nurture the faith. There's compassion and not patronization. And at the end, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, it gets us up to urgency. You got to have it now. We're late on this game. I showed you that thing, you know, 20 years late we're entering this and we got to go after it with some passion and go get it. When I was at Harvard, one of the things that was there is the libraries were open 24 hours a day. And I scratch in my head, why, why is that good for those folks and not good for these kids? So that's one of the things we went after. They're not open 24 hours a day. We can't afford that. But we had them open another extra couple of hours and later on several hours every day, including Saturday. <clears throat> now, Greg was talking about the mentorship. Students that struggle have personal, individual support. They knew who their teacher was that was going to go help them, their mentor. Students were required to work in teams to be successful. When I got to uh, Harvard, they put us in a cohort and we learned to work together and depend on one another and to help one another. Our kids worked in groups, so did the teachers. The other piece was educating parents preschool to 12. When they get to me as a sixth grader, it was kind of late. Not too late, but it was late. So we'd go back and try to get the parents to start talking and doing things with their preschoolers. So that way, when they come to us, you know, it's about, it's about academics, it's about college, but they can't, they're not forgetting who they are. At the end, our response was a community school uh, and project-based learning initiatives. I believe that's inside the core, too. Finally, again, 
from hope to faith, past fui, the students' possible uh, future selves. Has anybody ever read Stephanie Freiberg? She's a professor there at the University of Arizona. She's the one that got me hooked on student possi uh, possible future selves. And going from, I hope I can, to I have faith that I will. You get that into a kid's head, get out of his way. Because if he's got that faith, moved it from hope, the parents have that a lot. I hope my kid's going to be okay. To the kid saying, you know what, I am. And then finally, the community involvement in school mission. I think I told you a minute ago, I was kind of, in Spanish there's a word, kind of a travieso. I used to do some crazy, radical things. At the end, though, um, what happened at Apollo and what happened for those kids, that really was some pretty crazy stuff. And um, in 20 minutes, it's hard to squeeze it, squeeze it all in there. So I'll be over in the Alpine West if you're interested. And then, um, you know, thank you.